lovely and kind of hot corner of Glenwood and Lund. We are in the heart of Rogers Park. We're in the cozy and bustling part of the neighborhood where every Saturday morning we bring you another edition of the Live from the Heartland show. I'm Michael James. I'm here with my wonderful partner in this venture. Katie Hogan. And how are you, Katie? Um, I'm, I'm getting relieved. I'm getting relieved as each moment goes by. Can you, know, you feel the cool oh, coming down coming from on. Milwaukee? It's coming on us. I actually was talking to uh, one of our guests about to come on, and he told me in, over there in Little Village, it was 10 degrees hotter. So <laughs> this morning? Uh, he's really glad to be in. He says, Rogers Park's cooler than anywhere else. And I said, we are a cool neighborhood. Always, always has no been the case. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> it's true, it's true. Well, we got an interesting lineup this morning. We're going to talk about a couple of really, well, we're going to talk about a lot of serious stuff. We're going to have Dave Kraft of the Nuclear Energy Information Service. We're going to talk about Fukushima, the nuclear disaster and its implications for Illinois. Uh, we're going to have our good pal Tracy Siska up here from the Chicago Justice Project. We're going to talk about uh, the perceived crime and the way the media reports it. And then we're going to be real honored to have Kathleen Chandelmeyer Bartel and Peter Bartels up here and they're going to talk about the beach poets which have been doing poetry at Chicago beaches since uh, 1900 no since 1990 all right yikes <laughs> and uh, the masses are coming through the door a lot of times on a on a hot and sunny uh, summer morning we have a sparse audience in here because people are eating outside but the heat has driven them in but the cool and, is in here and uh, we have a great opportunity uh, I see a lot of people in the house that we know there's Jim Canadle the coach of uh, track and field at UIC there's there's all kind of folks here it's great good morning everybody <laughs> let's hear it from everybody in the crowd <laughs> yes yes they're here all That's right. proof. <laughs> okay, do you kick it off. Let's bring up Tracy Siska. Tracy, nice to have you. Welcome again this morning. Thanks for having me. Appreciate being back. Coming to the uh, cool end of town here by the lake. As they say, it is cooler by the lake in so many ways. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Uh, Tracy has been uh, the head of the, uh, the driving force behind the Chicago Justice Project, which is an independent, nonprofit research organization, um, doing good work on uh, policing, questions of policing and crime and safety in the city. And uh, it's interesting, I, I mentioned you to a uh, guest we had a couple weeks ago on the radio from the Citizens Alert, who does a kind of different angle at, mm -hmm. at the same issues. Um, and she did laud your work here on the radio. We appreciate um, that. So you have to have been busy. Right before I left home, CLTV reported there were 10 shootings last night. Thank God nobody can aim right, so no one was uh, hurt, killed. Um, but, you know, we do get a lot of media about a lot of violence in our city. What's up? Well, <laughs> you know, if the reporting was better, we'd actually have a clue what's up. That's what I thought. You know, but the problem is, you know, there's, there's a city of 2.5, 2.6 million people. So my, the kind of question we try to drive the press is, you got to use context when you get to that reporting. So the question is, is that up or down? And what should a city of our size expect from what there are the levels of violence in other cities? Should we be expecting more shootings or less shootings? It isn't just responsible reporting that we had this number of shootings because everyone gets scared and outraged by it, and then nothing happens. Yeah, there's that, that nothing happening thing. Right, and, and the response, the unfortunate is the response it drives is more and harsher policing tactics, longer sentencing, that type of criminal justice response to a problem. We've had now in Chicago for about 60 years, yeah, and, and we keep calling for the same response that has never worked, and we continue. It's like we're insane. We just keep doing the same thing over and over again, and we keep... Expecting different results. It, yes, expecting different well, results. Well, you know, it's the conversation always goes like, okay, um, we need more police, or we need better parenting, we're going to slam the parents with fines if their kids are caught out late, um, the schools are baloney, blah, blah, blah. 
isn't anybody talking about the fact that there are guns in children's hands continually available and replaceable and gettable on the... No, no one talks about two things, which is when you talk about guns, 85% to 90% of the guns that are used in the city originally are bought legally by stray purchasers, which means... Did you say straight? Stray. Stray. Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't stray, think it was uh, stray. Sexual, stray. So uh, it's basically I, a straw purchase where someone who doesn't intend to ever keep the gun goes in and buys it for a gang member who can legally buy them. Some people have bought 50 or 60 guns. They go into a gun store, they buy the gun illegally, they turn it immediately over to the gang member. So when people say, well, it's all illegal guns, it really isn't. Right. It's the fact that you have legal access to guns and gun shops that drives a lot of why the guns are here. But the other result is no one in the Chicago press talks about these communities getting jobs. Right? No one talks about the economics behind what's driving these communities. You know, we have all these TIFs. What people don't know is TIFs started in these communities to help these communities. Unfortunately, the money's taken from the communities on the TIFs, but never ever spent. TIFs, we're talking tax increment financing, financing here. Districts, right. Where, you know, tens of millions of dollars go into a fund that's off the books there in the city and can be spent for basically anything the mayor and the aldermen want. That's right. And we have a very tiffed city, um, including such blighted neighborhoods as The Loop, uh, well, parts they, of Lincoln Park. They ran out of blighted communities to tiff, so they had to eventually do The Loop. But none of the, mo I mean, none of the money was being spent in blighted communities anyways. Anyway. You know, um, between 1995 like, and 2005, something like this, the reader did an analysis, $480 million worth of TIF money got spent in the South Loop. <laughs> right? That wasn't that blighted compared to Inglewood and Lawndale and Little Village and communities that could really use it for economic development. We got a big one going on up here around Loyola. Too, yeah, it's called the Loyola TIF, <laughs> a really blighted area. But Tracy, beyond the TIFs, let's go back to the jobs, and I, I would extend that uh, also education. I mean, we have a, a school system that, uh, in order to get its numbers up, so to speak, I think helps to drive a lot of kids out of the school. Uh, <clears throat> I've known for years that uh, the Park District was... Uh, not prepared to handle the number of kids who would want to use the facilities after school. I mean, I just and there's no place for kids to go. No, when I was a kid growing up, there was a YMCA. We'd shoot pool, we'd go swimming, we'd do basketball. We had clubs. It was a, certainly a more privileged kind of you know it was a suburban town, uh, but. And the I'm suburbs kind of, here have that. Yeah, I'm just amazed that uh, kids have very little to do. After school programs are zilch. So you take the lack of jobs, you take the lack of uh, recreation opportunities, you take the lack of education. Um, we can see why uh, people may be hanging out in the streets and getting on each other's case. Oh, no, absolutely. And, and the, the, this idea that most of white Chicago, and certainly the white press in Chicago have, that gang members, all gang members, are passing up that $20 to $30 job at the factory to go sling a rock on the corner is just ludicrous. They're not passing up those jobs. Now, the, use, the old mantra was they're pass, they don't want to go flip burgers and work for a living. There aren't, an, there aren't anywhere enough flipping burger jobs in Lawndale to employ those kids. And those kids, you know, another um, issue that Chicago's got to confront is if in a lot of these communities, a 10-year-old doesn't think they're going to make it to 30. And if they do, they know they're going to be locked. They think they're going to be locked up. The average, you know, 10-year-old male child in these communities. And until we change that... It's a tragedy. Right. Until you change that mentality, the circumstances that made that, nothing is going to change. And the police know it. If you talk to cops, especially in these communities, they know there's nothing they can do. Right. They're, 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 they're unfortunately being tossed into a whole slew of horrible social problems, and they're like, fix it. And the police only have one response. They, 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 they arrest. Right. And that hasn't worked in 50 years. So the way we're getting portrayed in the national, international media, the, uh, besides talking about our heat wave, uh, we're on a violent crime surge. True or not? Is that, I mean... Not true. Historically, uh, 10 shootings uh, in one night is not something that... Ha it's, no, no. It has up until there's this police blog online, which I won't mention the name, but it's racist, misogynist, homophobic, and it's written by a slew of three or four or five anonymous officers, and it drives media coverage now. They started reporting the number of shootings every weekend, and now the media does it. The media has no idea whether that number is good or bad, Jeez. or what it compares to New York or Houston or 
LA. They have no idea. They just like to report the number because it gets press. And then, unfortunately, has now driven, extended to the internet, the national and international press about this crime surge. As far as homicides, yes, they are up. Shooting homicides are up like almost 20 percent, and not, if not more. But shootings are up only nine percent so far, which means it turns out that people have just, as Katie said earlier, have been better shots this year in a lot of these circumstances. Now, do we want the violence? No, it needs to be addressed. But thundering down this huge criminal justice response is not going to solve anything, and it's just going to make these communities worse, and then alienate the communities, elements in those communities that are good and want to cooperate with the police. Well, when they see pol police coming in, you know, and you know, cracking heads and doing everything they've got to do to respond to this, in an attempt to s solve a problem they can't possibly solve, the situation just gets worse. So. People are a little bit better shots, but basically it's not a crime surge. It's kind of the way it's been for historically. Historically. And the only problem with this year is that we had no winter. So everyone really enjoyed that no winter. The yeah. only one who didn't, there were a couple people who didn't enjoy it. The police. Yeah. They can't wait for cold weather because they know it shuts down. There's less people out. There's less interactions. They know it shuts down a lot of the violence on the streets. And then the people you know, involved in that violence. Yeah. We had no winner. So if you'd asked all the criminological experts throughout the, throughout the U.S., what should Chicago expect in homicides if we don't have a winner? If we continue the fall into the spring without ever having huge swaths of time where no one can go out, they would say about the number we're at. So another, another unexpected uh, consequence of global warming. Right, higher, and that's higher, higher crime of, rates in cold right. areas. And, right. And, and would-be cold areas. And would-be cold areas that if this, if this is a trend in Chicago, these numbers we're experiencing until someone finds the root cause are going to stay with us. So, you, you know, you mentioned root cause would be lack of jobs for lack, young people. Yes, lack of jobs. Lack of economic development in their neighborhoods. Education, to recreation. Right. Education, recreation. Now we got weather. Right. And I'm, I'm a firm believer, though, um, I follow William Julius Wilson in this. You have to have, there's no, a lot of these communities, there aren't that many examples of people who go to work in the morning, come home at night, right, right earn a living that can sustain their family. Their families, right. There's few and far between. That's the rest are hustling, they're out slinging, they're prostituting, and that, that's what kids see. That's and, huge. Right, and that's what they see. And then they're worried, they think they're going to die or be in jail by 30 I don't know how we change that. Right. I know the police aren't going to do it. Right. And until we do, nothing's going to change. It, it, it's wrong to expect the police to, to address those social issues. At, absolutely. And, and what we've got in Chicago, you're absolutely right, is what we got in Chicago is we keep increasing the police budget. This last year was the first time it got cut in the history that I remember. Yeah. Right? We keep increasing the police budget. You guys will solve the problem. We close mental health clinics, but we increase the police budget. And every officer knows that crime is going to go up when you close mental health clinics yeah, that people can't get point. their meds. Right. They know it. They, the police, even that horrible blog online was like, please don't close the clinics. Yeah. Even they knew that was a mistake. Yeah. Uh, you know, the mayor uh, has talked about moving more police into neighborhoods. He also talked about, uh, you know, when we had the NATO event here. It was a showcase the city. Uh, how do we uh, how do we juxtapose those two things? Showcasing the city with NATO, and then having the so-called crime wave that the media reports. And you may want to tell us why the media reports it the way they do. Well, it's it's easy. You know, the the media's the money is getting sucked out of the media industry, right? So it's much easy, It's much cheaper for Chuck Gowdy to spend 15 minutes. Looking at blogs. Looking at blogs and going to uh, Auburn Gresham and saying, talking to the cops, and there's violence, right? And it gets, it gets viewers. It makes them money. Last summer, uh, he did a story about going on a ride-along in Auburn Gresham or one of those neighborhoods, and he said, he started out by saying it was, he had to take more precautions for the safety of himself and his crew to be in that ride-along than he did when they went to Afghanistan during the wall or Baghdad during the war. I'd probably take my chances here. <laughs> <laughs> right, and for a white reporter to say that, you know, he's got the helmet and the flak jacket on. Jeez, Louise. You know, I took a ride-along in Austin five years ago. I didn't have any of that stuff on me. But that just, then that portrays 
to everyone not living in that community, that's what that community is like. It's a war zone. It's a war zone. Uh, you know, um, Tr Tracy, when uh, in the promo for this event, uh, I put out that the uh, Chicago Justice Project is an independent nonprofit research organization that tries to access and analyze data from criminal justice agencies to produ produce evidence-based reforms that will better serve the justice needs of local communities. Can you tell us about that? Sure. I mean, how, who, do, what criminal justice agencies are you going to? What kind of dialogue do you have with the powers that be in trying to bring about these reforms? Right. And what what the Chicago Justice Project has to do is locally here in in Chicago is try to take data from every criminal justice agency that's in the chain. So call for service through adjudication and incarceration. So OEMC, the police department, the Cook County State's Attorney, the Cook County Courts, Cook County Jail, IDOC. And basically what we're going to try to do is we take data from those agencies and we call it turning into actionable information for communities. So we're going to give them contextualized information about crime and violence in their communities and how the agencies respond. But not only that, we're going to allow them to look at that report about their community, but also compare it to the nearest three or five communities around them. And then one extra step, you'll also be able to compare it to diverse communities, so demographically different, so Woodlawn and Lincoln Park. You know, so that they can see, is there, is there some disparity? And we're going to provide information that's got context, so it includes data from five or ten years ago. Right. So they can see trends and blips and not automatically go off or when needed, and they start to see a pattern they don't like about sexual assault response in Inglewood, about how they, whether or not they arrest. They can then take that both to the police, the prosecutors, and the courts and go advocate with actual data that shows trends. So instead of saying, this, that's a bad apple, this is a bad case, the community members can go, no, we have, this is five years of data. There is no, this isn't one case. You've been doing this for five or ten How years. How do you get this word to community members and community leaders who are most... Uh, positioned to do Advocate. something about it. Yeah, so we've been, we've been, uh, I founded it five years ago, and we, I've been working pretty aggressively. We have a very diverse community advisory board, um, so we, we're attached that way to certain communities, um, and then a bunch of different stakeholders throughout the system, and hopefully in the next 12 months we're going to have a database up online that gives communities access to these reports, but we'll also make them available, and we're also going to, you don't have to, we're, to get by the digital divide, we're going to make arrangements with all the men's offices so they'll print off the reports for community members. That's good. And we're actively out in communities learning what they want to know. And uh, so... you got to be everywhere at once, man. Well, you, that's the only way you're going to get people to use it and understand it. That's just the reality. You can put data up online and say you're a hero, but if no one uses it and it's right. not being used in communities, it's totally worthless. Right. And we're dedicated to making sure it gets used. How do you think uh, the NATO experiment went? Um, I think that um, for the, I think that the, the, I don't think the protesters, um, I don't think there were enough protesters to overwhelm the police. There so were like, actually enough police to sure. overwhelm the protesters. Right, that's exactly what happened. Most days that right, I was down So there. the police had a, um, a, relative speaking on the major marches, had a good plan to handle a couple thousand protesters. Mm -hmm. Had it been the Iraq War protest of 2003 or 2004 when they take Lookshare Drive and there were 20,000 people there, that would have been a whole different scenario. Were the cops great? No. Were there circumstances where they went over stones? I have no doubt. You know, but I've had, I was friends with a bunch of legal observers on the street for most of the time. Do you think we overpaid for police protection that week? For overtime and what not? You know, it's one of those tricky scenarios, though, which is if things go really bad, they didn't have enough, you are horrible. Yeah. If they don't, no one shows up, wow, we wasted all this money. Right. You know, it's one of those things where the, I'm defending the cops here, they're caught in that catch-22. No, I, right? I agree. And I, it's a political ramifications of not being prepared, especially for ROM. I mean, I'm sure, I was quite sure that they were going to be as prepared as they could be because this is ROM's first thing and trying, I don't know how to show off the city, but... Yeah. He thought that was showing off the city somehow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> hey, Tracy, we always like having you here. We like to keep talking forever. But uh, as you know, we have other guests waiting in the wings, so to speak. So we need from you information uh, how to contact you and people can look into what the Chicago yep. Justice so, Project is all if about. there's any public event coming up. We don't have an event go, but we do a community listening tour. So you can go online to our website at chicagojustice.org. 
mm-hmm. and um, on there you can go to um, outreach and then community listening tour and you can um, send us emails if you want to invite us out to talk about what we do and we can learn from your community members what they want to know. Yeah, I really encourage anybody listening out there who does run community forums, this guy is good and he's got the kind of information most uh, community dwellers really want to know uh, the truth about things, data and comparison and context, all of that really needs to be heard. Thanks for showing up on you a should, hot day and coming to cool Rogers Park. Uh, you okay. should always be on here, Tracy. You should be on here once a month. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and let well, me know. We, we should have a couple more hours, and then we should also stream live every day from, from wherever we are. we got a lot of big plans. So let's have a big round of applause for Tracy. We're going to take a short musical break, and we're going to be back with Kathleen Chandlemeyer Bartels and her husband, Peter Bartels, and they're going to tell us about the Beach Poets, and we're going to get a little bit of information.